Guys, I'm heading out to that Amana package unit so I can switch out that high pressure switch and replace the hood panel that's uh, kind of disgusting where water has sitting, has kind of sat on it for a while. So we're gonna try to figure that out too. See if we can't get a little cross break on it and fix that. So it should take a few hours here. I'm debating on whether I'm using that pinch off tool or just gonna recover the refrigerant. I might just recover the refrigerant because it would be, uh, that pinch off tool and that braze is awful close right there and it's inside of that cabinet. So. I don't want to make any undue stress on myself. So we'll get there, we'll open it up, and I'll make a call on it. We're at our Amana unit here with the same glorious top. And there's the water standing. Let's see if we can't fix this thing. Maybe I can raise it up enough where it'll kind of slope back here. Or at least put a cross break on it so it'll run off a little bit. That'll be the idea. Don't have a lot of room to work with, but we should be able to do something. I'm going to get in here and shut the power off to the unit so I can take the top off and kind of climb inside and we'll evaluate how we're going to attack this once I do that. So we're taking our wires off there for the fan so I can take it out so we have purple brown and black we follow those in here we see we have a brown that's gonna go well this isn't the brown that's the thermostat wire come on Zach get it together the brown goes over here I'm just gonna go ahead and let you guys know to the capacitor we'll take that off the black comes in here let's see where does it go that's not it either hey I gotta get stuff straight here and chase it down well I know the purple the purple goes to the defrost control board down here and the black I'm sure goes to the bottom of the contactor and I'll tell you what if it doesn't go there I'll let you guys know instead of having to sort through the Goodman mess of wires that come standard on every Goodman unit. close down there to try to get that pinch off and cut that thing off and put the other one in. I think I just might recover just to be on the safe side because I don't want to have a boo-boo and you know break that joint or something like that wrestling around with it. Here's the, the downside to true blue is that it's very rigid when it's cold outside and we're in the lower 50s and it just it's, it can be a little bit difficult to use. But they are the best as far as vacuum, that's for sure. So here's the deal with the True Blue hoses. They are probably the best vacuum hose I've ever used. The permeability is very, very low compared to other hoses. I've tested several hoses, which are more standard refrigeration hoses against the True Blue. The True Blue got to the lowest micron level in any given period of time, meaning I put a bunch of hoses together, I put them to the vacuum, and True Blue was the best. There are a few negatives though that you should know about. Whenever it's colder outside, it's harder to handle the hose. They're more rigid and they're more rigid than your average refrigeration hose. And you don't want to buy the shorter length. There's like a three foot version. I think it ends up kind of troublesome. You kind of have to fight with the hose to get the pump oriented and get it close enough to the unit. Sometimes that can be a pain. And they can't take positive pressure. So if you accidentally put them under positive pressure, it might damage the hose. But with all that being said, I still prefer True Blue hoses. I think they're the best. I'll continue to use those hoses until another one proves itself better. So we have the Navac 4CFM battery pump hooked up to recovery cylinder. And we're going to vacuum it out just to make sure it's nice and clear. I had to add a piece there because there wasn't enough room because another downside to True Blue is the large connectors here. They are a great vacuum hose, but you have a choice of these smaller connectors down here or these right here. So, and they're great, but they're just large. So I'm vacuuming out this recovery cylinder to make sure it's squared away. Uh, 200 microns, we'll let it keep on running. Get it nice and dehydrated before we hook it up to the recovery machine which I'm setting up now. And we're looking pretty good now.
So I raised up the S-lock and put a screw in it. And I also have that standing S-lock on the back. I raised it up so we get a little bit of slope. And we're going to cross break the hood as well to get that water off of it. It's pretty easy to get these hood tops off. There's a couple screws in the S-lock, a couple screws from the top down. And then you can just pry it out after you get a little bit of that caulk off as well. I usually caulk the hoods all the way around so you gotta kind of take one in and pull it off but after you do that it usually comes up pretty easily the biggest issue with this particular hood was just getting some of that stuff out of the way as far as the caulking and working around the electrical conduits which are on that house side but as you can see it comes up pretty easily a little bit of water everywhere but definitely needed to be replaced before it went ahead and rotted out altogether there raise it up hopefully we got it put the switch on there in a second when it cools down there she is right there all right let's go ahead and pressure hold See how she does after I put some pressure on it. I uh, ran out of nitrogen like a loser, but uh, we did pass the very low pressure test. I did do blue, uh, big blue on it, checked it, and it looks good. I just wish I had a little bit more nitrogen pressure because obviously I tested a higher pressure than that. But the bottle went completely empty. Mother bottle's empty too. Way to be prepared, Boy Scout. But uh, we did pass our modified low pressure test. Got the Navac 4 CFM, got the Philippines gauge. Uh, I don't have the core movers on because these are those, I guess they're, I don't know if it's Cormax tool cores, but I don't have that tool. Uh, real world stuff guys, don't have the tools. So there's a few things in this video which you can take issue with under proper practice. So of course that vacuum isn't done the way I would like to do it and you can make the argument that it could be done better and I would concede that argument because I kind of had to make it work the way I could make it work and it was done well but it could have been better and I will give that to you guys. Also there's another thing I, I want to mention here that is not going to appear in the video is the fact that I did not swap the dryer that's in the evaporator section and I'd like you guys to weigh in on whether or not that swap is critical or not. I will tell you this after thinking it over I have decided that if I were in the same situation again, I will swap the dryer. Even though the repair was not invasive at all, it was pretty quick compared to a lot of other repairs, but still open the system, change the dryer. I just want to be upfront with that. You guys know that even though you don't see it here, I will concede that next time that I would in fact change the dryer if I'm faced with the same exact repair. And I kind of made an adapter for my true blue hose out of some of the brass fittings. So, one hosing it, we'll see how long this takes, but I have a hood top to put on, so I've got plenty of stuff to do while I'm waiting. So this is a pretty simple hood top right here. I'm actually just measuring a rectangular section. I'm gonna put flanges on it. So I put the tape measure in the S-lock on the opposite side. As you see, it's 47 here, and I do the same thing on the top side, just to make sure they're close. A little bit shy. Forty-six and a half, but we could press that to forty-seven so we can make it square. 
Got to measure the other way as well, then check it all the way down just to make sure it's close enough where you can cut a uniform rectangle and it will still 47 work. 47 long, 21 wide. Bend the rest of it in a flange because it's 48. We'll bend half inch flanges on either side. There'll be a little bit of a gap right here, but uh, we'll go we'll go hack and cock it shut or whatever. So go ahead and bend those flanges and cut that out. Cross break it on two by four or one by four I brought so we can give it some extra rigidity. Battery one is dead on the Navac, so we're going to battery two. It's been going for a long time. We're just about to get into the 600s. We're going to call it good if we get close. You can judge me. So the vacuum is definitely not perfect. You can see right there, I can't put the core mover on it. I can't do the proper decay test. There's things that are prohibiting me from doing it the way I wanted to. So basically, I just run it as low as I can. I let it sit there for a little bit longer until that second battery was just about dead. And then I left it like that. Not perfect, but as well as I think I could have done in that particular instance. So we're bringing the wires for the fan in. Purple wires going to the defrost relay, which you guys can't see. Brown wire is we're gonna pull them taut over here to the run capacitor, which we checked on the maintenance visit, so we know it's good. So it was good as of uh, a couple weeks ago, so it should still be good. Black wire goes to the bottom of the contactor right here. We'll tie them back up. We got to wire that pressure switch back in. Someone took it out and wired in like a, a fuse or something. I'll show you guys. I have to cut the uh, piece off of it. I guess it was just like a placeholder for the time being. So we had a fuse here, a three, but it's already a fuse on the board. So we're gonna take the leads that come from our pressure switch, which are right here, and we're gonna tie them each one of these leads, wire nut them off. Extra crap. We're hovering right at 700 microns. Might be there forever. Get some wire ties or something. Good thing about this vacuum is, since we're vacuuming here with the one hose, we know we're the farthest point from the system on the micron gauge, which means we're getting a true reading on the micron gauge. Well,
The recovery cylinder is 25 pounds, 10 ounces. And if we look over here on the data tag, it looks like we have 128 ounces. So, you know, eight ish, seven, eight pounds or so. So we'll figure that up while we're going. P51s have the refrigerant in there. We're gonna go ahead and start letting it in here so we can open these up. And we're gonna go ahead and open those up. Open that one up. Go ahead and start letting some refrigerant in. Recharge this thing and we'll see where we're at. Our machine is back up and running. Probably going to need to add some refrigerant very slowly. Let me see if I can do that. Wait till we're getting just a little bit of it in there. It helps if you turn the tank back on. Yes, it does. Here's some stuff going through there. Heading in the right direction. Don't want to do too much, too much, too quickly. Probably do a little bit more than that though. 21.9997. See, our pressures are really low. 60 on the suction side. Let's get a little bit more than that. Yeah, it's going there a little bit faster now. I'll just keep her high enough where we start building up again. See how many pounds we can get back in there. Now, here's something that would change about the charging of this unit. Now, I recharged it with the gas that was already in the unit, but I couldn't get everything out of that cylinder that I would have wanted to just because I didn't have anything to heat the bottle up with unless I was going to get out a torch and try to heat up the bottle, and I wasn't about to do that. So I just got the last couple pounds out of a regular R410A cylinder. So you didn't see that in the film. I, I don't know why. I guess I didn't film that last couple pounds of refrigerant, but it didn't all come back out of the recovery bottle. I was thinking to myself, and maybe you guys can weigh in on this too, what I would rather have done would be I could just use the recovery machine to pump it back into the machine if I wanted to. Just do it that way. I don't know if you guys typically do that. Maybe you do it the way I did it. Maybe you have a different way to do it. Put it in the comments if you have a different way. But there's some ideas for me, and that's what actually happened there you didn't get to see. Well, the call's all done, guys. Replace that high-pressure switch, recharge the unit, vacuumed it out with the uh, battery pump. I always like using the battery pump. It's, uh, it's fantastic. I like it a whole lot. Go ahead and replace that hood piece on top or doghouse or shroud or whatever you want to call it. Did a little redneck cross braking and you'll see that from my service there's always some ingenuity involved and maybe not exactly like the book says, but uh, I guess I'm okay with it. So I hope you enjoyed the video, guys. Like, subscribe, and share with your friends and family. But only if they like HVAC or otherwise they'll hate this video. What's up, guys? Where are you going? Where are you going? Don't run away. Don't be a wuss, bro. Don't be a wuss. Come on now. Come on, guys. What are you doing laying eggs in the middle of the yard? Ain't you got no culture? Also, where's the fourth duck? I think he may have perished. I think he may have perished. What the crap? What kind of redneck swine has these air conditioners just laying in his yard? I'll tell you what kind of swine the Zach Meister does. Got a mini split that don't do nothing. You hear that crap over there? Those guys need a bullet in the brain pan. Oh well. Another service call done. Back to life. <laughs>